Hello, hello. I am making a detour via the Cyclades in the Aegean Sea east of Greece in pursuit of a frying pan. For this to make sense, it is better to watch episode f uh, 13 first so you get a better idea on what I am about to present. I am, of course, talking about the late Neolithic Cycladic uh, vessels defined as frying pans. After summarizing the issue of the lids serving as calendars, mainly for tracking synodic periods of the planets, I want to list a few connections which I made uh, to these items. It has already been proposed more than a century ago by scholars Papatana Soglu and Georguli uh, that these vessels were used as mirrors. They are dark and glazed on the inside and when filled with water, the water surface becomes very reflective because of this, as ascertained via testing. To see a reflection on the surface of water has and always will fascinate the senses of the beholder. Mirrors are gateways into the worlds beyond our everyday perceptions, into the magical realm of our subconscious, where our dreams and wishes, but also our fears, await their chance to manifest in the world around us. But very early on, man has understood the value of mirrors in more practical ways. The subject easily lends itself to a full series on its own, if one would uh, want to go into all the aspects of mirrors through history. I would like to look at the specifics of astronomical observation mainly now, that this practice took place within a religious context is likely and probably dates from animist times. Several authors from antiquity spoke of on observing the sky reflected on a water surface, or by use of a mirror, and I found a few examples to underline this. Santa Cristina, a neuragic site located in the south of Sardinia, west of Italy, can be exemplary of such a Neolithic observatory that undoubtedly was the center of religious practice. It consists of a tolos structure uh, built underground with the stairs leading to a water, water hole or well situated underneath a central round opening in the top of the structure. Every full Saro cycle of 18.61 years, moon's reflection matches the pool under the tolos almost accurately. This PDF by Arnold Leboeuf describes how moon illuminates the inside as it rises in the sky. This illumination descends along the wall layer by layer in a speeding tempo. Once it reaches the surface of the well, the illumination connects with its own reflection on the water surface. This connection, having the appearance of a ladder of light, remains for a half an hour to proceed into ascension and to eventually leave the water at the bottom of the tolos in full darkness again. During the time of construction, however, moon had a different angle of declination, which means that when it reaches its highest point, moonlight would have let go of the walls for a certain short amount of time. Some archaeologists argue that the pool at the bottom of the structure was used by women for ritual cleansing baths and that this reflection of the surface or on the water surface is merely a matter of coincidence. While others stress that this is not the case and that the construction in Santa Cristina is, or better was, that of a very precisely built lunar observatory. I say was because, like I said, the declination of the moon has changed during the last 2000 years with a third of a degree. 
The close connection with time division is already apparent in the etymology of the words moon and month, or their equivalents in many languages that are believed to stem from the Proto-Indo-European root me, which means to measure. A fertile woman expresses that measure in time with her menstruational cycle. If I am not mistaken, the very first calendars ever found, dating deep back into the Neolithicum, are all based on the moon. Over time, lunar calendars merged into lunisolar and eventually into solar calendars. There are still calendars based on the moon in use, the main being the Islamic uh, calendar. The Hebrew, Thai, Chinese and Hindu calendar are lunisolar still to this day, each having their own way of intercalculating both lunar and solar, solar periodicities. But what the well of Santa Cristina is concerned, despite some reports of uh, peculiar peculiarities happening uh, during a solstice, Leboeuf denies any grand astronomical value at the site, apart from the one taking place during Lunastus. There are a number of these sacred wells around Sardinia, all dating between 2000 and 1000 BC, and they do not follow the same rule of orientation. I do not know if these all display the same camera obscura effect on these moments, although most are built in that same tolos or beehive style, which provokes this effect. I try to find more solid uh, evidence for the specific connection to solstices, uh, failed to find anything and abandoned that search pretty quickly. Just like the other Abrahamic uh, religions, Christian doctrine, or at least the symbolism it appropriated, has largely been uncovered as veiled rumination of sky and solar worship. Maybe fitting in the context of this presentation is the story of Jesus walking on water. In Canticum Canticorum, a religious text from the 4th or 5th century, Written by Bishop Gregorius of Nisa, we read, We see Jesus as we see the sun by reflection in a mirror, and we see the invisible Jesus as they see the sun using a clean mirror. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Socrates describes the difficulty experienced by the prisoner in adjusting with adjusting his eyes to the light of the outside world, without using its reflection on water or another medium. Also, Seneca describes the use of a bowl of liquid in order to capture the image of the sun during an eclipse. When you search for how to safely watch a solar eclipse, you will often find that this method of, of, of uh, observation through the use of a water bowl is stated to be unsafe. And who am I to contradict this warning? Perseus was well aware of the danger of looking into Medusa's eye, and nevertheless he used the reflection to defy her. And now that I mention Greek myth, one of the pages mentioning observing the sky by means of a water bowl is the wiki page on iridescence. Iridescence is, the, is an optic uh, phenomenon that takes place when multiple reflections of light interfere, uh, creating a colored light. We all know this from soap bubbles and of course rainbows. By now, most are also familiar with the appearance of so-called sun dogs, um, the, mini the miniature suns that seem to be captured in a rainbow-colored ring around the sun. I mentioned in an earlier video that I wonder if these could be the origin of symbols used for planets in arts like alchemy or astrology. The same phenom phenomena happens, of course, happens around the moon, um, 
some may have noticed tatters of rainbows appearing on the edges or on top of clouds or even seemingly just out of the blue in the sky. Iridescence can be observed in a bowl filled with liquid. So I pondered a while on how the ancients would have interpreted this phenomena, especially people who live on and around water each day. Um, they should be aware of the occasional rainbow-colored appearances when the elements interact. Iris was the personal ma messenger of Hera, mother of the, go the gods and uh, also of her husband Zeus. So how would the ancient islanders have interpreted the sight of such a refraction? Would it be as a message, a messages of the gods? But of course it isn't clear whether such a deity was at all present already in this early stage of Aegean uh, history. Another thing mentioned by, by Wiki that can be used to watch iridescence and eclipses is, of course, dark glasses. And the ancients did not have those, but they had this. Obsidian is a volcanic glass type uh, with slight signs of crystal formation. Humans have used it for making tools, etc. Uh, since at least a half a million years. The abundance of quality obsidian that can be found on the Cyclades allowed a certain specialization among the population. This material was used to carve their enigmatic idols. They, traced, they traded both their uh, craftsmanship as well as their obsidian and it knew a wide distribution range until the use of, of the mineral declined during the Bronze Age in favor of metal. Long after that, it was mainly used in mosaics. I tried to find evidence for the manufacture of mirrors or sheets of obsidian in that region, but I only found a study from Mesopotamia. I thought it would be reasonable to carefully assume that the quality of obsidian for shielding out sunlight might have been known to the ancients some way or another. The Olmec and Maya were well aware of the qualities of obsidian for production of mirrors. In fact, uh, the magic mirror which belonged to Dr. John Dee, uh, who was Queen Elizabeth's alchemist and court magician, was a South American import. He presumably used it to summon demons and to gaze into the spirit world, a divination practice called Skyring, that has long been upheld in the women's quarters of old Europe's farming communities, but has now uh, been new aged, uh, so to say, by neo pagans and such. I suspect Dr. D used it to view the eclipses more than anything else, but who really knows what he ventured into? Katoptromancy means the act of mirror gazing. When describing his fictive hero Hippias in his Hippias or the Bath, the Syrian second century writer Lucian of Samosata says the following thing about him Everyone else thinks himself a man of parts if he is held skillful in some particular art or science to which he has exclusively devoted his time and application. But nobody seems to contend with him for this first rank among geometers and mu musicians, and yet he shews himself as accomplished in every part of these sciences, as if he had applied to none other but them alone. How high he is advanced in the theory of light, its rays and their refractions. In katop katoptromancy, as likewise in astronomy, wherein all his pre predecessors appear only boys to him, above all those to praise him as he deserves would take up no little time. 
Just like a bowl of still water can be used to observe celestial movement, also a, also a thin sheet of polished obsidian can suffice for the, the purpose of watching an, an eclipse. In this paper, presented by Witt and Rappengluck, a number of obsidian artifacts are presented, 7,000 years old and found in Anatolia, and they were probably used as mirrors. This has prompted the historians to investigate whether the production of a Herschelian telescope, that is a telescope using mirrors, could have been constructed by Neolithic man. It is accepted that da Vinci drew the first model of such a telescope in the 15th century. Two centuries later, Herschel would, be, would build one uh, supposedly for the very first time. The PDF proceeds with a summary of the occurrences of convex and concave obsidian in uh, Neolithic cultures especially Mesoamerican cultures seem to have specialized in mirrors of all kind, made from obsidian, pyrite and bronze, and, liquid, and also liquid ones using water and mercury. To this day, indigenous people of South America view eclipses via the reflection in a bowl of water. The oldest obsidian bracelet ever found is almost 9,000 years old and originates in Anatolia, the Turkish mainland east from the Cyclades. This bracelet is made from high quality Anatolian obsidian and the craftsmanship applied in the drilling and polishing techniques evidence a high degree mastery. This same mastery was applied to produce eight concave obsidian mirrors found in Katalhöyük, uh, some um, seven to eight thousand years old. The researchers go over the meticulous process of replicating these mirrors with the ancient tools and abrasives, and they theorize that the possible uh, on the po possibility of uh, construction of a telescope by Neolithic humans based on the model using mirrors as applied by Herschel. Some hundred years back this rock crystal lens was found in Iraq and it was called the Nimrud or Layard lens. Nimrud being the Assyrian ruler during the era at which the lens was assigned to and Layard being the name of the one who discovered it. The function of the artifact remains debated. Although some propose that this artifact attests of the far-reaching uh, astronomical knowledge of the Neo-Assyrians, others remain skeptical, however, uh, what their uh, possible knowledge of telescopes is concerned. This lens is not good enough to be used for astronomical purposes. It could have served a craftsman since other artifacts were uncovered at the site bearing minuscule inscriptions. The counter argument is that the lens could have been used by the craftsman to manufacture these tiny carvings. This is another short recommended PDF for you. For you um, I cannot go into the de details uh, because more related factoids I want to share instead. In Euclid's book, Data Optica et Catoptrica, is written, If we fill a plate with water, we can observe the shiny burning image of the sun. Using a dish that contains water and observing the reflected and projected image on the wall. Actually, I cannot check that. I, it seems there is still mainly Greek copies of that book online. Maybe someone else has more luck searching for a good translation of Euclid's book. The use of reflection on mirrors or a vessel filled with water in order to observe sun and moon must have been relatively widespread, which can be derived from different ancient texts. I can only list so much, though there is another additional feature I haven't spoken of yet. It is that, mentioned by Euclid, of the reflections from the water surface 
of such eclipses casting a projection on wall or ceiling. I know basically nothing about optics and while looking if I could find anything of information on particularities of this kind of natural cinematography, I encountered this optical instrument called Camera Lucida. Earlier, when I addressed the Tolos of Santa Cristina in Sardinia, I mentioned the Camera Obscura uh, effect, um, which is caused by sun and moonlight casting a projection, a projection on the dark walls. Um, camera Obscura was the pre predecessor of the photo camera. It is a light tight box with a small hole at the front and if you aim that hole uh, towards an illuminated object, a reduced inverted image of this object appears exactly opposite of that hole on the rear, on the rear wall. Um, sort of what happens with an image inside your eye. Now, the wiki page on Mesoamerican mirrors mentions the possibility of the early awareness on, uh, of these people on how to generate a, such a, a camera lucida effect. And I personally had never heard of this trick before, so I thought I'd go check what exactly this was all about. This is the last thing I would like to share for today. Again, via wiki, we get the following explanation. The camera lucida performs an optical superimposition of the subject being viewed upon the surface upon which the artist is drawing. The artist sees both scene and drawing surface simultaneously as in a photographic double exposure. This allows the artist to duplicate key points on, of the scene on the drawing surface, thus aiding in the accurate rendering of pers perspective. Johannes Kepler was the first one to describe the camera lucida, uh, which is Latin for well-lit room, contrary to camera obscura, meaning dark room. Um, it was patented uh, 200 la years later and it's generally believed that this must have been about the first time someone actually fabricated one. Since then this instrument has been refined by artists and is basically an easy tool for anyone who wishes to produce a very realistic image. In 2001 Pete, uh, artist David Hockney published a book called a Secret Knowledge, Rediscovering the Lost Techniques of the Old Masters. It would cause a wave of disbelief and indignation among the artsy establishment. Together with physicist Charles M. Falco, he claims that the level of accuracy accompanied by the occurrence of a sudden and radical ch style change in drawings and paintings uh, is proof that the instrument was discovered by artists at least 300 century, uh, three centuries earlier, I mean. I have listed some videos in the description in which Hockney makes his point and demonstrates how artists like uh, Caravaggio, Vermeer, Van Eyck and even Da Vinci among other old masters, probably used optic tools like concave mirrors to reach such an accuracy and realism. He shows what the advantages and the drawbacks of the camera lucida are uh, by pointing out the consequences as detected in their paintings and drawings. Uh, I am not claiming here that the ancient Cycladic frying pan astronomers used any such techniques. But this last story about the camera lucida and the Hockney Faro hypothesis is, in my opinion, an example of how easy it is to underestimate the ingenuity of our ancient ancestors, of how blind also the specialists have become for our natural sense for discovery and exploration and essential drive for our evolution as a humankind.
I don't want to sound as if I do not appreciate the work of historians and archaeologists because that is, well, it's, that is certainly not the case. Um, my point is rather that it is a pity how the mainstream and the so-called fringe only seem to be aware of the sparse outlets of certain utilitarian uh, mouthpieces, whilst uh, yeah, so many put their heart and soul in their work each day. And the same for the art world. Luckily for us, some do not mind the risk too much of career loss or lack of publications, and they make their work available for every, anyone who loves to research things themselves. It hasn't been about the swastika this time, but it is still the symbol that brought me to the topics I put in my presentations. And there is still a bunch of new and old info on the cycladic uh, vessels and stuff uh, that I want to share. Um, it will take me a bit longer to wrap it all up in, in, in the next episode, but stay tuned for more. <laughs>